For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson with the latest readout video from our Wednesday Wake Up email newsletter. Which is always, we do invite you to subscribe to just in case we get deplatformed and need to tell you where to find us. Of course, some lucky people always seem to find what they're expecting to find exactly where they're expecting to find it. For instance, a major conflict erupts and the New York Times Climate Forward emails us about how, quote, global warming is making armed conflict worse, end quote. Worse? After the 20th and 21st centuries? How could it get worse? Well, the story starts by saying that in besieged Mariupol, Ukraine, quote, the people of that city are trying to survive not just shelling by Russian forces, they're also trying to survive without water, end quote. And if you say, well, yeah, that's because the shelling destroyed the water pipes, apparently you have it backwards. See, the water conflict chronology from an Oakland-based outfit called the Pacific Institute describes, quote, episodes throughout human history where access to water has triggered unrest or become a weapon of war, end quote, and says, quote, a hotter planet often makes dry places drier and hotter, supercharging competition over an already scarce resource, end quote. Aha, we say, you admit there have been enough hotter and cooler periods to make a comparison, and all of them before the late 20th century, definitely natural? For instance, the Holocene Climatic Optimum, the Minoan Warm Period, the Roman Warm Period, the Medieval Warm Period, and the Modern Warm Period in the former category, and the unnamed cooling that coincided with the Iron Age and the Sack of Troy, along with the Dark Ages and the Little Ice Age in the latter. And for the alarmists, it gets worse, because, if you'll pardon my history degree, which of these wars were actually caused by water or made worse by it? I mean, sure, the 20th century saw very destructive wars, but most reasonable people agree that any pre-1940 warming was mostly natural, and there was no warming from 1940 to 1970. So neither world war coincided with a runaway greenhouse effect. Besides, no sane person thinks either world war was fought over water, or that their destructiveness was due to drought rather than more advanced technology and increased industrial capacity. Mind you, looking further back, both the Thirty Years' War and the English Civil War were actually more deadly per capita than either of the World Wars for the areas where they were fought, despite the lack of high explosives, barbed wire, machine guns, submarines, poison gas, or warming, because both happened in the Little Ice Age, and neither was fought over water. As for the sack of Troy, well, in some sense it was fought over a waterway and trade, but it was also triggered by the widespread availability of cheap weapons due to diffusion of iron smelting techniques, and of widespread disruption of cultures and peoples caused not by warming, but by cooling. It certainly wasn't about wells and streams. Nor was the Hundred Years' War, the Korean War, the Mongol invasions, Rome civil wars, the Yom Kippur War, the War of Jenkins' Ear, the Flower Wars, or, to be frank, any war you ever heard of, and a lot you didn't. Despite which, the story quotes Peter Gleick, President Emeritus of the Pacific Institute, that, quote, climate change is unambiguously worsening the very conditions that contribute to water conflicts, drought, scarcity, and inequities, end quote. Unambiguously, climate change is worsening inequalities and, kitchen sink please, they contribute to water conflicts. Exactly what they expected to find, exactly where they expected to find it. And speaking of water, and finding things where you expect to find them, a new study recalls Patrick Moore's book Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom with its complaint that all the most urgent environmental disasters that require us to embrace socialism and austerity immediately are not things you can actually see for yourself. In this case, quote, satellite images taken over the past several decades reveal that more than 75% of the Amazon rainforest is losing resilience, end quote. How can you see that from space? And we'd also like to point out that the news story admits that, quote, for the past 50 million years, the Amazon has been in a wet rainforest phase. The contours of the forest may have shifted somewhat in response to ice ages, wildfires, and rising seas, but it was always able to return to its lush, verdant state, end quote. Rave rainforest. But since it was much warmer than today for 47.5 million of those 50 million years, and parts of the remaining 2.5 million during the Pleistocene Ice Age, it's kind of silly to claim that if the recent mild rebound from the Little Ice Age continues even briefly, it will finish it off. But of course, to hear these kinds of people tell it, the climate is so fragile that anything can do it in. Thus, the story says, quote, The Amazon is one of several tipping elements in the global climate, scientists say, end quote. 
Whereas the journal article authors, who are scientists, say, quote, the Amazon is recognized as a potential tipping element in the Earth's climate system, end quote, and then refer for that claim to another article that says, quote, many of the systems we consider do not yet have convincingly established tipping points. Nevertheless, increasing political demand to define and justify binding temperature targets, as well as wider societal interest in nonlinear climate changes, makes it timely to review potential tipping elements in the climate system under anthropogenic forcing, end quote. So, they admit there's this political demand to see it, even if it's not there. Now, we also want to add that if systems hit sudden nonlinear tipping points, you can't see them coming from space or anywhere else. And the story concedes that, quote, viewed from space, the Amazon rainforest doesn't look like an ecosystem on the brink, end quote. Unless you squint really hard. And now, a word from our sponsor. And that's you. Or at least it should be. Because if you want us to keep annoying the right people with our newsletters and our videos, you, our regular viewers, need to step up with a one-time or monthly contribution. I'm not talking a lot of money, unless you're, like, extra rich. The price of a cup of coffee a month, that's what we need from the 10,000 or so people who tune in weekly. If you do that, the video and the newsletter will keep bringing sanity to the climate debate and to you. And now, back to me. In the newsletter, we also note that the Canadian province of Alberta is removing its fuel tax of 13 cents per litre. And we wonder whether other governments will do the same, or whether they'll try to blame record gas prices on the Ukraine war, the pandemic lockdowns, or anything besides the obvious fact that they themselves are making gas expensive on purpose. We also wonder whether Canadian governments, and others, will try to remain serious on the point that even if you're a committed climate alarmist, unless and until the world stops using fossil fuels, it's a lot more sensible to use Canadian ones than Russian, Venezuelan, or Saudi. Entrepreneur Michael Binion disparages, quote, statements that defy logic, end quote, from our governing classes of all parties about how we should have pushed even harder on alternative energy, while columnist Jesse Klein hopes that, quote, U.S. President Joe Biden is learning a hard lesson about the geopolitics of energy and what it means for America and its allies to be reliant on oil and gas produced by unsavory regimes, end quote. Also, the Canadian government recently admitted that we essentially have no military capacity and should probably do something. But then neither Biden nor our ruling elite are exactly quick learners, are they? In this vein, we point out also that while expanding Canadian production and transportation capacities for hydrocarbon fuels are complex undertakings, requiring huge capital investments, if you look at how we went from virtually no armed forces to being a major power over the course of two or three years in both world wars, you see that we can accomplish miracles, particularly with modern technology, if we actually put our minds to it and put our backs into it. Unfortunately, hard work seems to be out of fashion. Thus, we encountered an ad saying that if we switch to a particular credit card, we could shop our way to net zero, because with every purchase, they will chip into the cost of planting trees. Quote, planting just eight trees a month could make you climate positive by removing more CO2 from the air than the average Canadian produces each year. If eight trees were planted every month for a year, that would be 120 trees, end quote. And we'll stop there because eight times 12 is 96. But why would a bank be expected to get arithmetic right, or forest management for that matter, or even though there's no such thing as a mangrove tree, end quote. The real point is that we're often told that there's this mind-bogglingly huge and awful climate crisis, but don't panic, we can fix it without breaking a sweat. You know, a few electric bicycles, a bit of foreign aid, hey presto, problem solved. This week in the newsletter, we also discuss another story that got pushed to the margins by the Ukraine crisis, the devastating droughts and related wildfires in Australia. No, wait, that was two years ago, right after the Amazon lungs of the world burned up and we all died, complete with celebrities tweeting pictures of other fires in other places at other times. Now Australia's flooded, or at least New South Wales is, and you guessed it. All climate change, all the time, all your fault. As new scientists explained, quote, for each degree that the atmosphere is warmed, it can hold 7% more water, and that's 7% more water that can fall to the surface, end quote. As Gertrude Stein said, interesting if true. Except in this case, not, because even the alarmists only think it's gotten just over a degree warmer in the last 170 years, so we should be seeing maybe 7% more rain than in Queen Victoria's day, and perhaps 3% more than in Eisenhower's, which you wouldn't even notice, let alone blame for unprecedented flooding. Which is again a silly word, since we don't know what flooding was like in New South Wales 250 or 2500 years ago, even if we do know that since European settlement, Australia has been hammered by repeated floods, the deadliest back in 52. 1852. 
and proxies suggest that over the last 2,000 years, Australian weather has basically been very nasty, with drought predominating, although the middle of the 20th century was unusually wet. And Jennifer Marahazi points out that the same Climate Council now demanding alternative energy to stop the flooding, quote, gave advice not so long ago that it would never flood again, that Australia was doomed to eternal drought, end quote. It all reminds us again of Dorothea McKellar's 1906 poem, My Country, which praises Australia's dismal climate in prose that would have shamed her Canadian contemporaries with their rushing rivers and twisted pines. McKellar actually scorns England's verdant green for, quote, a sunburnt country, a land of sweeping plains, of ragged mountain ranges, of droughts and flooding rains, end quote, where you get dead cows and then hammering rain. She says, quote, for flood and fire and famine, she pays us back threefold, end quote. Yeah, with 20-foot-long salty crocodiles, a hyper-carnivorous apex predator, in case you hadn't guessed, and so many venomous snakes that Australian Geographic thought it would be handy to list the 10 most dangerous. But not with more fires, floods, or droughts than back when this epic was penned. The newsletter also prepares to wrap up our Sunburnt Lands Up North tour by visiting Kugluktuk, which is in western Nunavut, in case you're even less sure of its location than that of New South Wales. Its appalling temperature record goes back to 1931, and the mercury bounces around, but it doesn't trend anywhere, least of all to somewhere warm and comfy. No tanning here, folks. We also continue our summary of a new peer-reviewed study of extreme weather trends with a topic that few alarmists seem to want to touch, and that's global greening due to rising CO2. It seems clear that the whole world is getting more verdant, even the desert portions, and that more CO2 is helping, along with better farming techniques. So if we really did get CO2 back to pre-industrial levels, as some loudly advocate, you'd see world food production drop by about a fifth. And if you need to be told what that means for the poor, don't ask an alarmist, because the answer is mass starvation. And speaking of atmospheric CO2 in plants, we also present a study from the CO2Science.org archive saying that Central Oregon did become warmer and drier during the western juniper growing season between 1998 and 2017, which in principle is bad for that particular prickly bush. But it seems that extra CO2 made up for it, and then some. It really is plant food after all. And for CDN, I really am John Robson, and I really don't believe in water wars.